And welcome to High School Physics Explained, and I'm Paul, and today I'm going to talk about the piezoelectric effect. And the piezoelectric effect is uh, an important feature of understanding ultrasound. So here we have two images that you're most likely quite familiar. This is an ultrasound, in this case it's my son, and um, you can clearly see an image is, is formed, and in, in another video I will talk about how that image is formed. But here is a uh, radiographer who is manipulating some sort of device on this uh, woman's abdomen to get an ultrasound image. So what is this device? Well, here's a picture of that device. And that device is um, called a transducer. And a transducer is, in essence, a device that um, emits sound and also uh, picks up sound that is subsequently reflected off any substance as well. Now, this transducer um, has to emit and pick up sounds that are in the order of millions of hertz. Um, in other words, it's a cell longitudinal wave, and um, the normal conventional way of producing sound, of course, as you probably are aware through speakers, uh, utilizes the motor effect. And the motor effect is, of course, where a current-bearing wire uh, experiences a force in a magnetic field. Uh, unfortunately, the ability of a motor to vibrate at such high frequencies is, is near impossible. And so we have to find another way of producing sound waves that allows us to get these extremely high um, frequencies, as I said, in anywhere up to 15 million hertz. How does it do that? Well, ultimately, the transducer is actually uh, comprised of an array of crystals. And these crystals are referred to as piezoelectric crystals. And one of the most common form of piezoelectric crystals is quartz down here. So for us to understand how quartz can be used to generate sounds and also pick up sounds, we need to uh, study, first of all, what quartz looks like at the molecular level. So here I have a whole bunch of uh, images that represent diagrammatically um, what quartz uh, looks like. Now, none of them have uh, are, are totally accurate uh, and all are slightly uh, different. You can see we've got three-dimensional models up here, two-dimensional model over here. But in essence, um, quartz is made up of silicon dioxide. And so you have different colors here representing the silicon and the oxygen. So here's a nice three-dimensional model. Here is a similar three-dimensional model uh, as well as up here. And here is a more two-dimensional way of looking at the quartz. Now, it's not precise or accurate in by any stretch of the imagination, but it gives you a sense of what the molecular arrangement is of the silicon uh, dioxide or quartz. And as you can see, it's lovely and geometric. And of course, that contributes to its crystalline shape that we see at the macro scale. Now I'm going to take that particular model and simplify it even more. And so here is a very simplified uh, version of um, uh, quartz or silicon dioxide. And I've just honed in on a very small section. As I said, this is not accurate in, uh, in, at all levels but it's a, a level or a scale that helps me explain to you how this uh, is utilized to produce uh, sound and also pick up sound. So from here on in, I'm going to give you a visual demonstration of how I can manipulate this particular structure in order to produce sound and also to uh, pick up sound. So here we have a model uh, of a quartz crystal. Now it's only a model, it's a fairly simplified model, a two-dimensional model. But as you can see, we have oxygen and silicon geometrically arranged. Now silicon is partially polar positive and oxygen is partially negative. But because it's all uh, in balance and in symmetry, the overall effect is that the whole substance is neutral. But what would happen if I were to apply a force onto the crystal? So if I apply a sideway motion force like so, what you can see is we distort the lattice. 
And now the bottom end becomes more negative and the top end becomes more positive. And as a result, we actually create a small electric field, or in another description, a small potential difference, which allows current to flow. Okay, and in this case, that electric field, of course, goes down the page. What happens, though, if I actually distort the crystal in the other way? So we stretch it out this way. So what happens now, of course, is, is that the bottom end with now has... Um, basically two positive charges and one negative charge so the overall effect here is now it's positive positive. and up the top here the reverse has happened and so as a result we now have a top section here that's negative bottom section is positive we generate an electric field but this time it's in the opposite direction to the hat what you had before and so if I were to alternate the vibration compression and relaxing and so forth like this, I end up creating an alternating electric field. And as a result, if I'm doing this, I'm actually getting an alternating current in the process. And that is in essence what happens when we strike a uh, crystal, a piezo crystal like quartz with sound waves. When sound waves hit it, let's say from the side, it causes this crystal to vibrate like so. But as I explained, that means we are generating an alternating electric field, which means we're generating an alternating current, and that, of course, can be picked up. And that is, in essence, how piezo electric crystal can actually transform mechanical energy into electrical energy. And it can do this very well into the millions of hertz. Now, similarly speaking, if we were to, in this case, apply a current to the electric, to this piezoelectric crystal, the same thing would result. But instead of the mechanical energy being applied to the crystal, if we applied an alternating current to the crystal, it would cause the lattice vibration, the lattice iris, to vibrate backwards and forwards. Well, that means if you place this crystal um, uh, in an area that would actually generate sound waves. So now we have an electric uh, energy or electrical energy converting into mechanical energy and hence sound waves. And then that's how a transducer works as well in that the um, applying a alternating electric field or an alternating current to the crystal will generate sound waves. But again, this is able to do into millions of hertz. And ultimately, that's exactly what an ultrasound transducer does. It converts electrical alternating uh, energy into a vibrational energy at extremely high frequencies. So I have a piece of crystal here. Um, so this is my crystal. All right. And over here, I'm going to have a meter. And I'm going to play around with this crystal in order to generate an electrical current. Now, before we go on, let's remind ourselves too that at the moment this crystal is not deformed anyway. And so if we were to look at the overall charges on this, it would be fair, it'd be neutral basically, uh, both top and bottom. Okay. And as a result, um, I would therefore have no reading at all on my meter whatsoever. The needle, if this is a galvanometer, would be pointing upwards. But what happens now if I actually distort my crystal? So here's my crystal, and I'm going to distort it like so. And in essence, what I've done here is I've applied a force in that direction, like so. Okay, a force in that direction. So what happens is, as I showed you in the video, we start to get a slightly um, electric field over here. And so what happens is that because this has now become more slightly positive, though I'll, choose, I'll use a color that's a little bit more obvious, uh, positive and over here more negative, as a result, the needle is going to flick to one side. Now, if I then take my same crystal, and in this case, instead of pressing on it, I actually um, let it stretch the other way, what I now get 
is I get my charge separation a little bit different. And as a result, my needle is going to move the other way. Now, how can I actually cause this crystal to distort that way, basically in and out? Well, that is simply done by actually hitting it with a sound wave. That crystal is going to distort in and out. And as a result, my needle is going to go back and forth because I'm changing um, the polarity here. I'm creating an electric field. I'm creating an alternating electric field. Hence, I will produce an alternating current as a result over here. And of course, computers and so forth can pick that up. So what happens now if we apply an alternating supply to it? Well, first of all, what we're going to get is we're going to get this crystal to d distort as a result of the direction of the supply. So in what, at one point, that supply will cause my crystal to distort in that direction. In other words, it'll stretch like so as the lattice gets distorted by the uh, alternating uh, supply. When the current is in the opposite direction, the lattice is going to distort in the opposite direction. Well, what you're going to get, of course, here is you're going to get a crystal that vibrates in and out. And so as a result, because it's vibrating in and out, we have the production of sound waves. So a quick summary. If I were to um, have my piezo electric crystal over here and I were to have a meter over here like so that if I deform this crystal via mechanical means I'm actually generating an electrical current so what we have is now is we have mechanical energy converted to electrical energy Right. However, if I now change this situation so that this is an alternating supply, I now have something else happening. I now have electrical energy converted into mechanical energy. Okay, as this starts to deform due to the alternating supply and producing sound waves. So that in summary is the piezoelectric effect. I hope you found that video useful. And remember, like, share and subscribe. Oh, and if you have a comment or a question or you'd like a concept for me to explain to you, please drop a comment down below. I'm Paul from High School Physics Explained. Bye for now.